Um, good morning, members and people on the platform. I'm taking the chair as I'm required to, to start proceedings in electing an act, a chairperson for the portfolio committee. As we're all aware, our chairperson passed away in December and we are required um, to elect the chairperson. We've been informed that a chairperson has been nominated or identified by the majority party, so we will start proceedings. Also, we have been informed in the name of ATC last night of the new member replacing our former chairperson, Duman Corsi. So in terms, therefore, we will proceed. In his name is Mr. Chris Machalacha. He will, has been formally uh, um, identified as a member of the PC on Trade and Industry. Therefore... Sorry, Andre, to interrupt you. Um, Mr. Chris Manamache is struggling to log in. Um, I don't know what is wrong with the link. I'll accept the reason it is. No, it's fine. Thank you. We will we'll, we'll continue with proceedings. We do correct and we so we can. Just in order to proceed, I will to do a roll call and I will call the names of the members on the platform. Mrs. Hermans. Good morning uh, to everyone on the platform. I'm present. Thank you. Mr. Mumbayani. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Thank you. Mr. Burns Namashi. Molo no pala di namalo di pala and goes. Thank you. Mr. Mulder. Good morning. Uh, everybody, I'm present. Ms. Mutahu. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Mr. Cuthbert. Good morning, everyone. Ms. Mwatsi. Good morning, everyone. I'm present. As, as previously indicated, the new member is struggling to join the platform, but we do correct and we can proceed with, with the election of the chairperson. In terms of Rule 158 of the NA, we are um, calling for the name, names for members of, for, for the person to be nominated as chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry. May I have a nomination? I have the hand of Mr. Mumbayani. Chairperson, thank you very much. I rise to nominate in the name of Honorable Recording in progress. Judy Hammonds to be the chair of the, the committee. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mr. Mbiani nominated Ms. Judy Hermans as chairperson. May I have a second for that, Ms. Mutahu? Thanks, Chair. I second the nomination of uh, Honorable uh, Judy uh, Hermans. We have a second, Ms. Mutahun, second the nomination of Ms. Mbuyani for Ms. Judy Hermans as the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry. Are there any other nominations? There being no other nominations, I declare Ms. Judy Hermans duly elected as chairperson of the Portfolio Committee of Trade and Industry and request that she take the chair and start proceedings. Thank you. Good morning, uh, committee secretary. Thank you very much for the nomination uh, for the position of chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry. And I hope that I will be able to, I will work very hard to do justice uh, to this position. I know I have very big shoes to fill and um, I will do my best. Thank you very much. Can we ask that the agenda be flighted? We have, have, have the, name, the hands of Mr. Cuthbert and Ms. Mutahul up, Chair. But I'm not just sure if that was anything prior to the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Cuthbert. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairperson. Well, newly elected Chairperson, congratulations on your election. Um, as a DA, we look forward to working with you and we hope that your tenure 
as acting chairperson, uh, you know, the, the vein in which it continued ha uh, continues throughout the rest of the term. I think we've worked together relatively well, and um, I'd like to see that moving forward. And then just a, a bit of housekeeping. I did write a letter to you, I think this past Friday, um, making a request regarding our briefing that we are to have with the SIU chairperson. So I just wanted to know if you could please have a look at that and come back to us with that particular response. Thank you very much for the well wishes and we will attend to the correspondence that we have received from you, Honorable um, Cuthbert. Thank you very much. Honorable Motau. Thanks, Chair. It's the uh, previous hand. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. Okay. Then. Honorable Mulder. Thank, thank you, um, Honorable Chair. Um, from the Freedom Front Plus side, I also wish you well. Congratulations. I uh, think you're a worthy chair, and I'm looking forward to work, work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those well wishes. I look forward to, work, to working with all political parties to, to uh, meet the mandate of this portfolio committee. Thank you very much. Um, we have the agenda in front of us. Uh, we're now going to look at apologies. Over to you, uh, PC Secretary. Chairperson, we have this an apology from Mr. McPherson, who's still out on party business, as Mr. Ping is attending another committee meeting, and Ms. Yaku has informed us she's attending a conference, so she won't be able to attend this morning's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Those are the apologies that we have. Thank you. Duly noted. Um, our next agenda item is the adoption of the agenda, which will deal with uh, the briefing by DTIC, NRCS, and SADS on the public protectors report regarding the illegal conversion of goods carrying Toyota quantum vans into passenger carry carrying MIBAS taxis, and then closing remarks and enclosure. Um, I see the hand of Honorable Burns Namashi. You are noted. No, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, in fact, when I raised my hand, uh, it was still during the time when uh, honorable members from uh, other political parties were making their congratulatory remarks. And I was also going to say, as, as the ANC, we don't uh, take it for granted, uh, the privilege of being um, um, nominated to this position. Uh, we feel very much humbled, and we uh, also want to extend uh, the congratulatory gesture and uh, commit our support uh, to your work as our chairperson. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Burns Namashe. Honorable uh, Moatse. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Let me also start by congratulating you in the newly elected position. Congratulations to you. And then we hope you are going to work with us very well. We have trust on you. Uh, and also let me uh, move for adoption of the agenda as, as presented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, members, for those kind words. Um, obviously, our success is going to depend on our collective effort as members of this portfolio committee. Uh, can I have a seconder for the adoption of the agenda? May we have a seconder, Honorable Burns Namashe? Honorable Chairperson, I second the adoption of the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Burns. So uh, we're looking at the uh, main agenda item. Uh, we have the public protectors report that was referred to the committee. 
um, for its consideration and, and the report. In light of this referral, the committee is required to consider the content of the report and the recommendations made by the public protector and to submit a report in this regard. The, for the purpose of this meeting is to comply with the referral requesting uh, DTIC, NRCS, SABS to provide an update on its action plans to implement the remedial action set up by the public protector as reflected in the report. And we hope that by the end of our deliberations, after the presentations and engagement by, by uh, portfolio committee members that we will have achieved uh, that aim. So over to um, the person leading from the department, I think it's um, the acting COO, Ms. Matamela, over to you. Um, thanks, thanks very much, um, Honorable Chair. Um, it's Stephen um, Hannibal here. Um, okay. um, good morning thank to you, you Honorable welcome. Chair. Thank, thank you so much. Um, good morning to you and, and all the uh, honorable members um, on the platform. Um, Chairperson, um, I'm the, uh, the acting DDG in the um, industrial competitiveness and growth branch um, under which the technical infrastructure institutions fall. Um, so with your permission, Chair, I'll just make a very brief introductory remark um, and introduce the, uh, the members of the team um, that will be undertaking the presentations. Um, and uh, from the DTIC side, it will be uh, Dr. Chenge Damana. Uh, with your permission, I'll ask him to um, take the committee through the DTIC's presentation. He's joined by uh, Ms. Anna-Marie Lotter and uh, Mr. Amos Mbele. Um, also from the technical infrastructure team, they are our technical infrastructure experts in the department. And then from the SABs, um, it's the lead administrator, Ms. Jody Skultz. And from the NRCS, it's Mr. Um, uh, Edward uh, Mamadise. Um, so Chair, as you've indicated, um, the uh, presentations that um, the committee will be receiving this morning will be firstly just to sketch a little bit the legal mandates of the DTIC and its institutions in this particular matter, and then to provide a progress report on um, what action has been taken in response to the um, public protectors um, report. Um, and so, uh, Chair, if you are comfortable, I would then request that we hand over to uh, Dr. Chenge Damana um, to uh, provide the DTIC uh, presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanaval. Over to you, Dr. Demana. Uh, uh, okay. uh, can, uh, good morning, uh, members. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us a chance to come and explain. Um, I'm going to run through my presentation uh, very quickly. Um, because I think my colleagues from the entities will have a lot more uh, to add. And uh, in the interest of time, I see your time seems to be limited. Um, can I please get the presentation <laughs> on the, uh, being shared? Can we check who's uh, sharing the presentation, please? Uh, Secretary? Um, Solo is sharing the presentation. She may just, I think she had the, the, not the wrong presentation on. She's just checking to ensure that she has the right one, Chair. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, there, there we are. Uh, thank you very much. Can we uh, immediately move to slide three? Um, uh, as members know, uh, this is really the, the work of the department. Uh, which involves localization, uh, exports, um, investments, and in industrial competitiveness. I think of importance here is just that the NRCS and the SABS uh, are, are contributing to, to, to this work, especially when it comes to industrial competitiveness where quality uh, falls. But however, 
quality of products is also required in terms of localization, exported products, and the, the ability to do this uh, conformity assessment, testing, inspection, et cetera. Uh, it's something that uh, investors also require uh, because it helps them uh, to export and sell their products in the market. So they, before they come here, they need uh, to know that we can do that, uh, which helps. Uh, can we go to the next one? Uh, so, in terms of the NRCS and the SABS, we know that they report to us. Some of the work that they do is actually delegated by a policy warning department. And we know that in delegation, the owner still uh, retains a, a whole lot of responsibility. Um, so, as the public protector has indicated, and I think that's the reason we are, we are here, uh, there's room for improvement, uh, so we will say something about that. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. So the owner of um, the policy when it comes to the safety of vehicles is the National Department of uh, Transport, uh, and they use the National Road Traffic Act. And some of the work uh, has been... Um, delegated, uh, but in the terms of the NRCS, uh, the NRCS was appointed as the inspectorate, uh, so as the inspector for manufacturers, uh, importers, and builders of uh, vehicles. Uh, the NRCS, uh, in turn, has, uh, they use what we call compulsory specifications, which are compulsory standards that everybody has to to adhere to uh, in order to uh, act actually implement uh, the work that uh, the Department of Transport wants done and also other work in the automotive space. Uh, the SABS, um, we know they develop standards uh, and once those standards are referenced in, in uh, regulation or legislation, they become mandatory and the NRC has called those standards uh, that have become in, mandatory. They call them comparison specifications. I think we are aware of that. And we are aware that the SABS uh, is one of the test houses in the country. So they, uh, they are one of the conformity assessment uh, providers. Uh, and the work done there normally is done under a contractual arrangement. Uh, so the, the the client will say what they want tested uh, exactly uh, and then uh, sign off on that. So uh, you, you won't expect the SABS to do more or to do less. Uh, can we go on the next one, please? <clears throat> so in the context of uh, the vehicle conventions, uh, I think uh, a silent point is that uh, the public protector dealt with uh, how a process of retrofitting was performed. However, vehicles uh, were already uh, illegally converted uh, way back, uh, going way back. So they, they were, uh, it, it, said, it said in the report, uh, 2,353 vehicles that were known uh, to have been uh, converted illegally. Uh, and uh, uh, these vehicles then were, it was uh, a policy decision was taken that the, instead of taking them off the road, the best way will be to retrofit them. Uh, but as we now know, only about 350 actually went to be retrofitted. So this is what the, the report dealt with, but the findings seems to be uh, throughout the they, they don't really take into account uh, any more the 350 compared to the rest of the set. Uh, so, and also it is, it is permitted uh, for people to convert vehicles. We say it's illegal when uh, a vehicle is then put on the road without the necessary approval process uh, that has been uh, basically delegated for the NRCS to do. So the NRCS is bypassed, and then the, the owner or the company doing the conversion goes straight to the Department of Transport, and they get licensed without the necessary paperwork from the NRCS. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, so 
uh, in this slide, I think the most important points are the two bullet points um, uh, at the beginning. Uh, the public protector found that uh, there were gaps uh, uh, in terms of illegally converted vehicles, that the information, um, if a, a vehicle was um, uh, sold initially or produced initially as a three-seater uh, panel van, uh, because it bypasses the NRCS once converted, doesn't go back to the NRCS, then it's possible for it to be registered at the Department of Transport Registering Authority as a 16-seater. Uh, so you go from a panel van then to a minibus. And the DOT agreed that they, there is a possibility that their frontline staff at the licensing offices are altering the information on the ENRT system. So this is this uh, fraudulent activities are happening at, at that point. And so a solution, I, I would think that recommendations that come from um, uh, um, committees should be, should actually look at how do we close that gap? Uh, because we, we know, and this is not contested, uh, that there is a problem there. Um, uh, the, the third bullet point uh, talks to the fact that the, the public protector, unfortunately, uh, 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 explain it as if uh, it's inherent in the NRCS legislation that they are an inspector for MIB, which are the manufacturers, importers, and builders of vehicles. But that can't be correct because we know they were appointed by the owning department. So I think uh, that is problematic. Uh, and actually, the department tried to clear that uh, by stating that um, um, law enforcement are the people who are supposed to remove vehicles from the roads and that that competency lies with their own entity, the road traffic management uh, Corporation, RTMC, uh, the provinces and, and the municipalities. So they, I think the NRCS will explain a lot more in detail in, in that regard. So I, I think this misunderstanding is it's a problem. Um, the SABS, uh, I, I think the SABS will explain. Um, uh, I, I think I have already said that, that they work under contract. Uh, let's go to the next one, please. So because it's misunderstood what the NRCS does, it seems as if the RTMC, this Road Traffic Management Corporation, a very big body, uh, is actually a, a small unit in the, in, the RN, uh, uh, in the NRCS because the work that they do uh, then doesn't find, uh, is not highlighted in the report. There are no findings and there are no remedial action. Well, we, we are not sure whether that means that they were working as well as they could, uh, but we know that vehicles that they could have removed uh, are still in the road even today. Uh, thank you, the next one. Um, so in terms of the remedial action for the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, it says that the, the minister should uh, harness and foster good, effective, and efficient working relations between the NRS and the SABS. Uh, and I think that's the totality of the, the remedial action for, for the department. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, uh, it should be noted that this remedial action is not based uh, on any findings against uh, the, the department as such, um, but, uh, Anyway, we, um, you, there's always room for improvement, so we, we, we don't dispute that we can improve. Let's go to the next one. Uh, uh, so with this report, uh, when the NRCS, SABS, and ourselves received it, uh, we realized that there were quite a, a number of uh, uh, errors uh, and uh, misunderstanding in the report. Uh, that uh, could be uh, corrected. But uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, the only way to correct is to go to court. So the entities ask the, the department uh, to take the public protector to court, and the department said, no, they can't do that because we need uh, collegial working relations, and we also need cooperative governance. So it's not ideal for uh, entities of the same government taking each other to court. We should rather address whatever we can uh, in the report. So in that regard, then the, the department and the entities sat together and said the work between the NRCS and the SABS compl is complementary and they have always worked uh, closely together. But uh, I, th I think uh, what perhaps was lacking was a structure, a structured agreement. So we agreed on a memorandum of agreement and then we also agreed on a memorandum of agreement between the NRCS and the Department of Transport. So NRCS and the SABS have a memorandum of agreement as, as well as transport and NRCS. In addition, we uh, have uh, discussed and agreed that uh, where work is delegated to the NRCS, that before sign off, of whatever is being delegated uh, to the NRCS between the department and NRCS, that uh, the, also the Department of Trade and Industry needs to be involved um, so that it can be taken through our own uh, uh, departmental uh, legal services. Um, uh, further, in quarterly reports of the entities, we have asked that uh, the entities address uh, any findings, uh, whatever they can do. We know that the reports have challenges, but uh, I, as I said, there's always room to improve, and uh, we know that uh, this problem is quite serious. Um, so they they have to tell us uh, on a quarterly basis when they report to us uh, what, what they have done on what they are planning to do, etc., in, in its own section, uh, so that it's it's set out uh, clearly. Um, uh, furthermore, the Department of Transport and the DTIC, the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition now, uh, we, we do share ideas on a regular basis. We even had a project last year where we were working uh, with industry together, looking at the, the uh, fees or levies that are paid for vehicles and vehicle products that are exported and looking at how best to, to regulate that. And I also know that we have another strategy, Vehicle 2025, uh, safe, Safer Vehicle 2025, that the NRCS is championing and uh, transport is also part of the stakeholders. Um, so in conclusion and in hindsight, I, I think we should have uh, agreed as the department to have the report re reviewed and corrected because the findings that are not um, uh, correct uh, are leading uh, people who are trying to come up with solutions like the committees um, of parliament to, to struggle uh, to come with solutions that are relevant and they deal with the problem. Because as we speak, there's still probably a, a 1,000 plus, 1,700 plus of uh, vehicles that are used as uh, public transport that are uh, converted illegally. But year after year, they get a license disc from uh, the, the, the licen licensing offices and they are not being pulled off the road, which is not, it's not ideal. Um, I think uh, I'll thank you here and so thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Damana. Um, the next presentation, is it from NRCS? It's from SABS. From SABS, okay. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ms. Skulls. Uh, good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for the opportunity to present. Um, Chair, while I'm bringing up my presentation, uh, let me just congratulate you on your appointment as, as Chairperson. Um, very, very um, uh, privileged uh, to um, be led by, by you, and I'm sure you'll do a, an absolutely fantastic job. So congratulations, Chair. Apologies, I've got a bit of a challenge with my voice, so um, 
I'm just trying to find my presentation and now my computer seems frozen too. Apologies, let me just try again. Let me check if there's anybody, anybody else from your team who can, okay, they, it started. So. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me just put it on presentation mode. Thank you. Um, so um, if you don't mind, I'll put up my uh, video feed. Um, I think it may just uh, help a bit with the signal. Um, Chairperson, so I'm going to talk through the legislative mandate, the um, uh, just the, the role of SABs within the technical infrastructure institutions, the status of the public projectors report and, and what's subsequently been done, and then share with you and the committee um, the factual and, and legal errors in our view um, um, that, that's contained in the public projectors report. And then there were quite a few questions that the um, Portfolio Committee on Transport had asked, but the purpose of the presentation is just to talk about the remedial action for SABs um, and um, or the, remedial reaction, the remedial actions contained in the report and then the, the response by SABs. Chair, I think Dr. Demane has indicated this is the legislative mandate of the Bureau of Standards. I'm not going to um, go through it. Suffice it to say that um, our, um, our primary mandate relates to voluntary standards. Um, we, there's a, there's a, standards, a, a national standards development process which is a consensus driven process. It involves academia, it involves industry, it involves the regulators. We pull these colleagues into a forum, into a technical committee or, or a subcommittee. Um, there's a formal engagement. Um, they then develop a standard for a particular area. That um, document is then gazetted. It's in the public domain for around um, uh, 60 days. We take those comments, we edit, and we then uh, publish a final standard. So, so that's the, the standards development process. It's a, it's a voluntary process. It's consensus driven. And um, uh, the end result is a standard that regulators can use in the execution of their mandate. Um, we also do uh, promote quality with respect to commodities, products, and services. And then we render conformity assessment services. That is, is in effect, we test in the labs uh, and we audit both products and management systems. Okay, this is just um, SABs in, in, in the family of technical infrastructure institutions. I've indicated this is our mandate. We've got the NRCS, that's the regulator. SANAS accredits us. So in terms of the, the work that we perform, um, both in the labs and in, um, in our certification area, they then make sure that we've got the relevant capabilities and competence to do the work um, that we need to do. Um, and then we've got NEMISA, um, uh, which underpins all of the testing through through calibration. Um, and so this is the, the technical infrastructure institutions um, in South Africa. Just a, a key, I think in the in all of these engagements, a key difference between um, SABs and the NRCS, we focus on voluntary standards. So any company who um, wants to, you know, check whether their product um, complies with a particular standard, can contact us uh, and we can do um, both the auditing and then the testing in the labs for them. So it's a voluntary process. The NRCS is the regulator and they take, they can take one of our standards, they can amend that standard and publish it in a, in a gazette, making it then a compulsory standard or, or VC, a compulsory specification. In terms of what was required um, uh, by the public protector for the um, Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, we've, we've had to uh, implement an MOU. I think um, Mr. Mamadisi will, will talk to that. Um, we have entered into this MOU um, a while ago in 2019, and this is the governance framework um, that we have in place. It's, uh, we've updated it you know, to include really relevant pertinent issues that affect the two institutions. Um, and it, this framework is not to say that 
we we don't we don't talk where there are issues um uh, the, the relevant officials get involved where Mr. Mamadisi and I need to get involved. We then also get involved to try and unlock whatever um, challenge is, is currently facing us. Then, Chairperson, just in terms of the status of the public um, detectors report, I think Dr. Ma Damana has, has indicated this. Um, we, have a, have a, we have a legal opinion um, internally, which raised a number of factual legal uh, factual and legal errors in terms of the report um there, there was no remedial action directed at sabs specifically so in terms of an action that sabs has had to implement there was none in the report that was directed at sabs i think dr demana has, has spoken to the challenges we wanted to take this report on review I think um, this has now prescribed. We have six months, as I understand it, after the report is published um, to take the report on review. So that um, option is, is no longer on the table. But um, there's been an MOU signed with the, with the National Regulator of Compulsory Specifications. Um, and I, I think the, the, the point that I'd just like to share with the committee is that I think the public protector has um, unfortunately presumed that SABS has policy tools at her disposal that we actually don't have. And so we haven't been able to um, execute or, you know, respond to, to the number of um, uh, issues the public protectors raise because they are factually incorrect. We don't have those policy tools and it's not within our mandate. So Jay, just the next couple of slides is around um, the the um, questions that were raised um, in the PP's report around um, factual and legal errors. I think the first one is that they said that we didn't conduct adequate quality assurance tests. Now each standard contains the kinds of tests that's required for a particular product. We would test according to that standard. If there are any other standards or any other tests that are required to be performed that's not within the standard. It is not the responsibility of the Bureau to do that. It is the responsibility of the regulator who would then say, these are additional tests that should be included. Take this back into the technical committee and review that. And Chair, the NRCS has in fact done that already. They've identified a number of areas. They've put that work into the technical committee and, and, and Edward will, will um, chat to that shortly. So we were then contracted as we are in a number of other institutions because we have a commercial mandate as well to conduct tests. So we test a product. The customer can also come to the Bureau and say, this is the standard, but I don't want you to test according to the full standard. I only need you to test parts one, two, and five. We then would issue a test report based on the testing of parts one, two, and five. We would not then issue a test report based on the standard in its entirety. The next one is that um, the public protector had, had indicated um, relating to these tests that SABs um, the, well, they did not suggest that SABS carried out the test contrary to the applicable national standards. However, they did find that the tests were conducted on static vehicles um, and that they felt that there wasn't conclusive um, evidence on the status of these vehicles. Now, the test, the test, the, the standard itself would prescribe the test methods uh, to be tested. So it would then say it would be on um, and I think this was on the on the rollover test, it is done on a static vehicle and not on a moving vehicle. And that is contained within the national standard. Um, and then I think I've already explained the process through which um, standards are developed. Where there's a need for that standard to be amended, a regulator can inform SABS that these are additional considerations. Uh, it's then taken up in the technical committee and then it goes through this national consultative process. Um, so, Chair, so um, the next area is that um, they, the, the, um, they were saying that SABS had not conducted adequate quality assurance tests, and I think, once again, the adequacy of those tests is, is vested in the, in the regulator. <laughs> Excuse me. 
um, and then clear the, the, the um, compulsory specification 8023 specifically provides that the evidence of compliance um, with the requirements of this compulsory specification um, would be recognized by the regulator if it's from a lab that forms part of an international or regional mutual acceptance scheme, a lab that is accredited to ISA or IEC 17025 by SANAS or an ILAC um, um, uh, affiliated um, body, or a lab that has been successfully assessed against the requirements of 17025. And 17025 is the ISO standard, the International Standards Organization relating to um, labs and our labs should be managed and run to the satisfaction of the regulator. Um, so, so test reports for homologation purposes aren't just limited to those that are issued by SABs. The regulator can decide they want a range of other tests. Um, and then, you know, those test reports could be sourced from a lab that meets the above criteria, as I've just indicated. SABs um, was a um, provider testing as a service provider, and it is not the responsibility of the Bureau to regulate compliance with regulatory requirements or the conversion of vehicles. Um, and I, I'd, I'd spoken earlier about the tool set um, that SABS has at her disposal, as well then as the, uh, the process of, of developing a national standard. The questions that the um, Portfolio Committee on Transport raised with us was, how does SABS work alongside the NRCS? And I think I've, I've um, indicated that. The NRCS as well, they, um, uh, they are um, an independent third party, con con uh, well, they rely on independent third party conformity assessment service providers like SABS or any other accredited facility. Um, and that there's no exclusive relationship between SABS and the NRCS. Um, they wanted to find out about the role that SABS played in the retrofitment process. Um, and I think I've indicated it was limited to offering testing services. We received vehicle test samples from the South African Taxi Finance. They had been uh, requested us to perform those tests, and that was the extent of the um, of our involvement in the matter. I must indicate that the, the test reports that we have date back to 2009. So unfortunately, a lot of those colleagues have subsequently um, you know, retired, resigned over time. Um, and so we've had to look at um, what, what is available institutionally. Um, there were there were questions about minimum requirements, um, and um, the, the the customer um, can ask for specific um, tests to be um, performed. We would then issue a test report only on those specifics. So I think a key point to note is that the bureau is not a regulator, um, and therefore it would be the it's in the purview of the regulator to determine then what are what are you know, whether that test report is sufficient or whether those tests are sufficient or whether any other test should be, um, should be required. Um, those are the three, the two tests. We did the, um, the rollover protection or the one on anchorage and then the, um, um, the tilt test as outlined in the National Road Traffic Act. Um, a question was asked about when SABS lint. Um, that Toyota condemned the conversion of panel vans for use as passenger carriers um, in the taxi industry. We are not able to determine that, unfortunately. And, um, but that doesn't have any bearing on, on, on the role that SAB has played because we don't have any legal authority to regulate the conversion of vehicles. And um, we wouldn't have also any power on making any um, decision whether or not to convert um, uh, these these vehicles into um, passenger carriers. Um, the Department of Transport, they've indicated that the process of retrofitment didn't require the authorization from the original manufacturer, um, as the process of modifying secondhand vehicles is legal, and that's captured for in the, the Road Traffic Act. And I think you know, without without um, expressing any opinion, I think the the view by the Department of Transport explains then why um, Toyota was not was not consulted. Um, I think there were questions about um, the the minimum safety specifications, and once again, 
SABS it doesn't have the, the mandate to indicate these are the minimum safety specifications. The, the national standard would determine tests, um, materials, chemicals would, that would be used in the manufacture of that product or specify which tests need to be done. Where any other tests, um, uh, it would be, it would be um, uh, uh, outside of our, our mandate. Um, Chair, I think this is the very much the same. It's about safety specifications, and I don't want to belabor the point. Um, it is it is outside of the, the mandate to issue minimum safety specifications for vehicle conversions, um, and we did not, in fact, issue any of those uh, safety conversions. We um, the, the safety specifications. I apologise. We tested the vehicles based on a specific standard. Um, okay, and I think the we must note the point and make the point that I think the, the carnage on our roads as a result of this really weighs heavily on one as a South African citizen. And in the discussions we've had with the NRCS and the DTIC around this, um, I think we are fully cognizant of, of, of um, the impact of this. I think the, the challenge has been, you know, we can only do what is within the mandate of each of our of our institutions, and then see what what we can fix, and then also be directed by the um, uh, remedial action um, as indicated by the public protector in her report. Uh, Chair, very similar um, one about um, um, you know the the points the public protector made in her report. Uh, well. Um, and, and that the Portfolio Committee on Transport also raised with us, they were saying, despite having these safety tests, vehicles are still involved in a lot more accidents. And so I think the, um, the point is that the regulator would then have to relook at what those um, safety tests are and how um, one would, um, would have to then uh, include those additional tests within the national standards. And I think Mr. Mamadisi would, would talk to that because that certainly has already been done. And then there were questions just about mitigation. Um, uh, you know, what, what could be done to mitigate these? Um, and, and I think um, the NRCS would also talk to, would also talk to that. Um, the last question was about a monitoring mechanism to ensure that this doesn't reoccur. Um, and I think this um, is in the purview of the of the regulator. And certainly, I think when um, uh, when we do get information from regulators, including the NRCS, into our technical committees, we then ensure that we really manage that process um, to develop or to amend that national standard um, that is it is within our time frames. So, Chair, I think those are the points I wanted to make. Um, thank you very much. For the opportunity to um, to to share it, uh, the presentation from the Bureau of Standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Scholes. Uh, can I hand over to Ms. Mamadise from NRCS? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, again, congratulations on your appointment. Um, Let me start first with uh, introducing the team. Um, I'm assisted today by Duncan Mutengwe. He's doubling up as the acting COO, as well as the head of automotive uh, department. I'm also assisted by Deboha Apan, our head of legal, and Edward Matemba, head of strategy. I will start with the background. Chair, the thesis of my presentation would try to outline the factual um, uh, basis um, with a view to assist the committee in getting all the relevant information as to what happened with the, um, the issue at hand, which is the illegal conversion of motor vehicles into Texas. Um, Chair, the important thing that we want to emphasize is that vehicle conversions and modifications are allowed in terms of the law. They 
must follow the prescribed process as um, per legislation and the compulsory specification. The challenge, however, is that some of these conversions happen through the back door. They don't follow any um, um, approved process by the relevant entities, um, including ourselves and the DOT. Um, there has been um, um, concerns generally from our engagement with the a subcommittee on transport about the conversions in general. So our view is that um, the policy uh, department, which is the Department of Transport, has incorporated in the legislation the process for conversion of vehicles. If there is a change of view, the policy department would have to amend the legislation so that um, the NRCS can act accordingly in line with the legislation. In the case of the illegal panel vans, the NRCS became aware of the um, illegally converted panel vans in June 2008. Um, I think I want to point out Shay, here that um, the NRCS was only established on 1 September 2008 as a separate entity. Before that, it was part of the SABS. So the problem as it is stated by the PP emanated and we inherited it as the NRCS upon our formation on 1 September 2, 2008. But in terms of the legislation, of course, Chair, we take full responsibility for all the actions that were done by the uh, regulatory division of the SABS at the time. And therefore, we take full accountability for what had happened insofar as it pertained to the scope of the NRCS. Um, in order to deal with the issue of illegally converted, uh, I mean, illegal activities relating to import and export of motor vehicles, um, ITEC, which is the International Trade Administration Commission, commissioned a study group. Um, um, we were part of those, uh, of those stakeholders, including SARS, SAPS, DOT, SIU, um, and the uh, International Vehicle Identif Identification Desk. Um, although the scope of this task team was to look at the issue of import and export of vehicles um, generally, it became apparent during the discussion in this task team that there is also another issue which relates to um, illegal conversion of panel vans into taxis. The task, the task team then realized that it is not within their mandate, the, the original mandate to look into the issue um, and decided to establish a subcommittee to look specifically at the issue of uh, modified taxis. At the time, the NRCS became aware that there were 2,353 illegally converted panel vans. Um, amongst other contributions that we have made as, as the NRCS during the work of the subcommittee, we realized that there is a loophole or lacuna in our law in terms of how the modification has been defined in the Road Traffic Act. We suggested to the subcommittee that the definition should be amended so that it can incorporate all vehicle modification irrespective of whether of the use, whether it was going to be used as a long distance group touring or, or, or as a taxi all modification should be treated as such. This is important in the context of the um, taxi recapitalization pro pro project 
that is the, uh, at the center of the discussion today, Chair. Because in terms of the TRP requirements, the, the requirements are only applicable to minibus and midibus that are designed um, to carry passengers for reward. So um, this is obviously a challenge because most um, people will then submit vehicles uh, for modification under the guise that these vehicles will not be used as taxis, but they will eventually find their way uh, on the road and be used as taxis illegally. Um, there were also other investigations that were conducted by SIU, uh, the Freenaging Licensing Office, um, um, and that investigation uh, revealed that there is corruption in terms of um, 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 registration of these vehicles. Some vehicles were registered without uh, complete documents. Some were registered without an LOA or certificate of compliance from the NRCS, which is a, a, a huge challenge. Now, dealing with the NRCS mandate in the automotive space, Chair, as Dr. Dimana has alluded, we have been appointed as an inspectorate of uh, manufacturers, importers, and builders of motor vehicles in terms of Section 7 of the National Road Traffic Act. Um, our scope and mandate in terms of the appointment, um, I must mention again, Chair, this is the appointment that we inherited from SABS because it was the SABS that was appointed at the time before our formation. But with the split, we then carried forward this mandate as the NRCS. Our scope in, involves evaluating and recommending MIBs uh, applicants for registration with the DOT, inspection of the registered MIBs at least once a year, we recommend suspension and cancellation for MIBs who have been found wanting in terms of the law. We issue model numbers, commonly known as NATIS model numbers, to vehicles that um, meet the requirements. We issue a certificate of uh, compliance for minibus and mid mid minibus uh, models approved for reward. That would be your taxes in terms of the uh, NLTA. We issue letter of authority for vehicles um, manufactured and imported or built for private use. That would be for individuals. For instance, if an individual imports a vehicle from anywhere else in the world, we will then um, um, stop that vehicle at the port of entry uh, until we scrutinize the application and issue a letter of authority for the vehicle to enter South Africa. Um, the approval process of motor vehicles in general, um, as Jody has also alluded, the um, NRC has enforces a compulsory specification. The compulsory specification um, VC8023 is the relevant um, uh, specification that covers motor vehicles, um, categorized as M2 and M3 vehicles. Um, in terms of the approval process, all motor vehicles that are covered by the VC shall be manufactured in accordance with the VC. Um, MIBs shall have a vehicle model or any modification approved by NRCS prior to registration of that vehicle into the uh, NATIS system. Approved motor vehicles shall be issued with homologation and uh, or a compliance certificate or an LOA and a NATIS model number, which allows that individual vehicle to be um, um, registered. So in other ways, um, um, a chair, if to give you an example, if Toyota want to manufacture a, a Toyota Hilux, 
they will then submit a sample to us. We will scrutinize it um, with all the supporting documents. And if it meets the requirements, we will then issue the compliance certificate to Toyota together with Natis model number to enable to produce um, Toyota Hilux of similar kind um, for the market. As I've alluded, the minibuses are covered under the VC8023, which specify minimum uh, requirements for uh, passenger carrying vehicles with a capacity of nine persons, including the driver. They are commonly referred to as M2 and M3 vehicles. Um, the question has been raised that what do we do to ensure continuous um, um, compliance by the original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs. Um, we do that by, by conducting um, continuous market surveillance. We do have a market surveillance strategy in place, which enable us to conduct um, inspections at the um, manufacturing plants, at the ports of entry, and 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 the, the dealerships. Now, the status of the public protector report. Um, Chair, I think I want to put the matters into perspective that um, the NRC is still of the view that the public protector has failed this money to comprehend the mandate of the NRC is and separate the roles of all the entities that are involved in the regulation of motor vehicles. But that is not to, to say, Chair, that um, we want to um, involve you as a court to review the public protector report. But what we want to do is to assist the committee with all the relevant information to enable the committee to be able to fulfill their oversight role and having had all available facts um, on, on the table. So whatever we say um, and, and in relation to the public protector report is not asking you to act as a review court, but to enable you to have um, all relevant information that will enable you to perform your duties. That's why we, 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 we say, Chair, that we have accepted in good faith the, some of the recommendations in the Public Protector Report, and we are doing our utmost best to ensure that we improve on the process of the um, motor vehicle conversions and motor vehicle regulations in general. Um, my colleagues have already said that uh, um, we intended to take the PP um, report on review, but we decided against that uh, for the reasons that have already been uh, alluded to. The, some of the reasons why we say we don't um, concur with the PP findings in the report, um, especially in terms of the how the, um, the legal requirements or the scope of our work is concerned has been interpreted. The NRCS does not have a mandate and inspection power of vehicles operating on the public road. We are not a law enforcement um, entity similar to RTMC, the municipalities, um, and, uh, and the rest. In other ways, uh, it will be an anomaly for us to be standing on the road with our inspectors, stopping individual vehicles. It is not our mandate. Um, we will be acting ultra virus beyond the scope of our legal mandate. The NRCS mandate is to inspect vehicle at the source, which will be the MIBs, um, the dealership, 
and the points of entry, as I've alluded to earlier on. The registering authority should not allow any vehicle to be registered with, without the NRCS approval. In other ways, no vehicle should be registered with the provincial authorities without um, an, an LOA or certificate of compliance issued by the NRCS. It is the responsibility of the law enforcement authority to ensure um, that the vehicle that is being registered complies with the law. If it is a conversion, it is the responsibility of the law enforcement authority to ensure that the conversion has been approved uh, in terms of the, uh, the legal framework, including that they have been issued with a certificate of compliance by the NRCS. Vehicles operating on the public road must be dealt with in terms of uh, section 44, which deals with the um, um, safety of vehicles, uh, section 89, 87, which deals with the um, notices that may be issued by relevant law enforcement officers, and section 89, which deals with offenses and penalties in terms of the NRTA. Um, and these, these sections vest powers on the law enforcement authorities to impound or um, remove any vehicle from the road that is not um, uh, compliant. It is not the mandate of the NRCS. As much as we have been appointed as the inspectorate for the MIBs, we have not been given these powers. These powers remain exclusively at the disposal of the law enforcement authorities. The, our mandate ends um, with the issuance of the LOA or the uh, compliance certificates, as well as the notice number for the specific model. Um, and from there, the registration process and ensuring that uh, uh, the vehicle continues to comply um, is the responsibility of the MIB, the DOT, the RTMC, and the law enforcement authorities. This implies that NRCS does not have access to any information pertaining to what happens to individual vehicles that um, 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 a, a particular consumer has. In other ways, Chair, we would not know if the Honorable Chair purchased a, a panel van and at her backyard, she decides to convert it into something else. We wouldn't know about that, but the road um, uh, traffic in enforcement officers will be able to have access to that information because they know the details of the vehicle, who purchased it, where do they reside, and that is beyond the scope of the NRCS. Now dealing with the, um, the requirements for um, a new taxi vehicles, under the uh, taxi recapitalization program. Um, in 2008, the National Department of Transport as the policymaker um, decided on the taxi recapitalization program in order to replace the existing taxis with the new taxi vehicles. The implementation date was 1 January 2008 it was applicable to nine to 35 seater vehicles. It was not applicable for vehicles meant for private and touring um, vehicles. The new taxi vehicles enhance safety requirements in addition to the requirements of the compulsory specification. And those new requirements were gazetted in terms of notice um, R895 of September 2008. The additional requirements for new taxi 
vehicles where that the vehicles needed to have strength of seat and seat encouragements, a prohibition of fold up seats and middle seats, seat dimensions and driver seat partitioning. Um, sideway tilt, um, restraining devices, safety glass, emergency exits and entrance, entrance and exits and passageways, side and rear reflective marking and 100, per, 100 kilometer per hour speed limit sticker. Notice of load the vehicle needed to indicate how many passengers can be carried in that vehicle and the rollover protection device braking system which was type two test. These were the additional requirements in terms of the TRP that the new taxi vehicles needed to comply with. The role of the NRCS in the registration process. The MIB um, will manufacture, import or mo modify a vehicle it will ensure compliance with the relevant legislation. It will present a sample uh, of the vehicle with supporting documents to the NRCS. NRCS will verify compliance of the sample vehicle and issue um, a compliance certificate and that is number for the model that has been specified. Now turning to the illegal uh, Panel van conversions. After we became aware as part of the task, the task team that I've alluded to earlier on, Jay, we embarked on a two week blitz in order to gather information around the issue of um, illegally converted panel van. Um, in, in that two weeks, we managed to visit together with other entities. We managed to visit 43 dealerships, 11 registered MIBs, two unregistered MIBs, and 50 taxi. Um, in total, we inspected about 212 vehicles. The findings in terms of the, um, uh, the information gathering, we found that some of the registered builders for minibus category were found to be involved in illegal conversion of panel vents. Most dealerships were found to be in partnership with either registered or un unregistered um, builders who were doing illegal conversions. Non-compliant Toyota quantums which were converted were predominantly registered in our system as panel vents. Most co converted um, quantum panel vents could be registered without valid notice number. None of the registered builders converting uh, quantum panel vents were certified by NRCS, except for Toyota as an importer of quantum minibus. Unregistered builders operating in backyards were also involved in the conversion, illegal conversion of panel vents. Due to these um, 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 bleeds that were conducted and as well as the work that was done by the Department of Transport in KZN, we managed to delink one of the biggest converters of panel vents, which is Umkene Auto Trimmers. Our efforts to try to delink other MIBs like Taxi R Us and Peterson Taxi World um, were met by legal challenges um, because of the issue that I've raised before in terms of the lacuna or loophole that is in, was in the law at the time where a person can then claim that the vehicle is not going to be used as, as a taxi and it will bypass the requirements, the additional requirements of TRP in that sense. And uh, yeah, in, in terms of the uh, uh, KZN, and um, they have managed to withdraw the operating licenses 
um, for some of the non-compliant um, 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 builders. Now, the implementation of the corrective action, Dr. Demana has alluded that the policymaker, which is the Department of Transport, when they realized that there has been a challenge with the illegal converge, uh, conversion of panel vans, they decided to rectify those panel vans instead of removing them from the road. Um, the department then approved the requirements in September 2009 that would be followed by the testing that was going to be done by SABS and Gerotech. The project to retrofit all these illegally converted taxis um, started on 1 March 2010. The TFM which is one of the MIBs, was the MIB that was issued with approval and two notice model numbers by the NRCS after they have complied with the requirements and submitted a sample to the NRCS to carry out the, um, the conversion or retrofitment of the illegally converted vehicles. The process that was agreed upon with the uh, National Department of Transport and all the key st stakeholders involved in the retrofitment process was that TFM will then do the modification. Um, once the modification or retrofitment has been completed, the NRCS will inspect the modified uh, or corrected taxi, then issue a letter of authority. Each owner had the responsibility to conduct the DOT and ensure that the vehicle is delivered to TFM for retrofitment. NRCS will then be called upon to inspect the vehicle and issue the LOA for um, a specific vehicle. Um, by the end of 2014, only 348 vehicles were issued with the LOA, which means that um, about 2,005 vehicles remain on the road, as Dr. Demand has alluded, um, and they have not been corrected in terms of the process that was outlined by the DOT. Now turning to the public protector findings, um, the main finding against the NRCS is that the NRCS failed to take effective and efficient measures to ensure that um, all M MIBs comply with the compulsory specification as envisaged by the NRCS Act in order to restrict the illegal conversion of goods carrying Toyota quantum panel vans. Uh, uh, into taxes for reward. Our response is the NRCS, um, which must be taken in the context that I've alluded to earlier on, that it is not to embarrass or attack the public uh, protector, but is to place correct facts before the committee to enable it to do its work. The NRCS does not agree with the finding the reason for that is that the NRCS has a market surveillance strategy, which it, it is implementing to regulate the MIBs. The focus is on high risk areas in a bid to ensure that we maximize our resources. NRCS on average conduct 1,300 MIBs inspections annually to ensure compliance with the uh, compulsory specification. However, that's not, that will not eliminate the problem of unscrupulous uh, MIBs who do illegal conversion because we cannot have the residence inspectors at all MIBs and we cannot have 
resident inspectors at every individual's house to ensure that individuals don't do any illegal conversions on their, on their cars. When non-compliance is identified, the NRCS will act decisively as a regulator, as we have done with the Umgeni auto trimmers. The, one of the issues that is raised by the public protector to support her finding is that a letter of authorization from the Toyota was not uh, obtained. But this finding um, Chair, ignores the fact that there is no legal requirement for a letter of authorization by the OEM. That is so in terms of the um, NLTA, as well as the regulations that were issued by the um, 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 Department of Transport. While we acknowledge that um, SANS um, 10267 requires a letter of authorization, that standard has not been called upon in our regulations or by any other regulations or, 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 or legislation. Therefore, it remains a voluntary standard. Um, we, don't, we didn't have to comply with it at the time. In this case, the NRCS followed the approved retrofitment requirements that were approved by the Department of Transport uh, as I've alluded to, the process involved identifying critical parts and system of vehicle that were um, um, needed to be adhered to in terms of the TRP requirements. The vehicle were then tested by SABS and the Gerotech, as I've alluded to, and the TFM will do the conversions or retrofitment and NRCS will only issue an LOA after it is satisfied that the retrofitment has been done in line with the requirements of the TRP. Um, another second issue that the public protector uses to support the finding is that the NRCS failed to identify 1,986 vehicles although it is empowered in terms of section 17 of the NRCS Act. But this finding chair again ignores the fact that the act that she refers to only came into effect on 1 September 2008. And therefore the NRCS could not have invoked a legislation that was not yet in operation at the time the issue of panel vents, illegal conversion of panel vents arose. And even before the NRCS itself was established as a separate entity in terms of that legislation. As we have al already indicated, the illegal converted panel vents were already identified in June, 2008. Um, and even before the act came into effect, even before the NRCS was established as a separate entity. Again, we want to reiterate Chair, that the NRCS does not have a mandate nor inspection powers on vehicles that have been sold to individuals for re registration process. Continuous compliance of those vehicles can only be done at a point of registration by the licensing authorities under the DOT and the RTMC and the provincial um, uh, uh, departments. NRCS could not have detected that this, ve uh, this vehicle, since it is not a registering authority of motor vehicles, by a simple um, analogy, Chair, the example that I've given you, that um, only the registering authority will know um, who is the owner of which vehicle, 
and who is the um, where where do they reside and what vehicle whether the vehicle is fit for the road or is continuing to comply with the uh, the, the legislation therefore nrcs could not invoke section 17 to deal with these vehicles that were operating illegally on the road because those vehicles could only be there could only be dealt with in terms of the um, relevant section of the national road traffic act which empowers certain law enforcement authorities to do that um, i think we have re uh, reiterated the point um, and a lot chair i would move to the next point the third issue that the public protector emphasized is the impact of these illegal converted panel vans into minibus taxis. Um, as I have already alluded, NRCS have no control over individual vehicle registration process. They illegally converted panel vans into minibus, minibus taxis were illegally registered through the licensing authorities. Um, without any approval from the NRCS. It is important to note, Chair, that these illegally converted panel vans, they are still registered on our system, on the NATI system, as panel vans, which is evidence enough to show that the registration of those vehicles should have, would have happened under um, um, suspicious circumstances or fraudulent circumstances. Our only recommendation is that those remaining illegally converted um, um, uh, panel vans uh, be deregistered or be impounded by the um, by the authorized uh, 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 entities from the road exercising their powers in terms of the legislation. In terms of the remedial action, the remedial action is that the Minister of the DTIC must take a gender and effective step to harness and foster good, effective and efficient working relationship between NRCS and SAPS. Except to point it out that the um, the remedial action as alluded by the PP is disconnected from the findings that have been um, made against the NRCS. However, the NRCS has proactively concluded an MOU with SAPS uh, in September, uh, October 2019. We have review, reviewed that MOU um, recently, Chair, um, to take into consideration some of the challenges that have been identified by the PP um, in, in her report. The MOU is a framework under which the parties um, mutually interact to improve the working relationship and are able to collaborate with each other on matters of mutual interest. Um, we also concluded in another MOU with um, um, the DOT, as Dr. Demana has alluded, in August 2021. The MOU strengthened the relationship between us and DOT, also helped us to um, define the roles and responsibility of each party because we are all collectively involved in the regulation of the motor vehicles as through the compulsory specification and, and the delegated mandate that we have received from uh, DOT. The MOU also created a platform for the discussion on matters relating to vehicles. Uh, especially the tax recapitalization in, in South Africa regarding the uh, determination of the taxi age limit requirements, um, which is a discussion that 
we have already started with the DOT and other stakeholders. In implementing some of the recommendations of the PP chair, the NRCS established a task team, a dedicated task team of inspectors to inspect all registered MIBs, especially those have been involved in converting goods carrying vehicles into passenger carrying vehicles in order to ensure continuous um, compliance, also enforce a compliance with legislation where we have identified non-compliance. The focus of the task team has been to look at the issues of complaints handling, investigation of alleged non-compliance of vehicles, investigation on misuse of NATIS model numbers, the ongoing audit of all the registered MIBs, all registered body builders of motor vehicles, have been categorized into small, medium, and large companies using our risk-based approach. 100 high-risk um, MIBs have been identified and have been in inspected by the end of the last financial year. The preliminary outcomes of that investigation um, reveal that there are no active companies that are conducting illegal conversion of, of, of minibus um, um, uh, vehicles. The NRCS, as part of its, its market uh, surveillance strategy, continues to inspect um, MIBs, um, 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 taking into account the um, loopholes that have been identified by the uh, public protector as well as the risk associated with each individual MIB to ensure continuous compliance. Phase two of the um, investigation will be concluded by the end of this month. Um, I may just highlight that we, we, we already have a draft report produced by the task team. And, and we are on track to finalize same. And if necessary, we'll be able to share that with the DTIC and the DOT. The NRCS is addressing some of the uh, loopholes in the modification of the um, motor vehicles. Um, um, in general, and despite the fact that we have highlighted that we, we uh, the, the PP got it wrong when she um, 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 raised the issue of um, letter of support by the OEM, um, in terms of our new requirements, we ensure that the supporting documents by original uh, equipment manufacturer is part of the requirements so that the second tier uh, vehicle uh, approval can be done. In other words, uh, the, um, the letter of authority by um, um, uh, the original uh, OEM is a requirement that will eliminate the issue of, 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 of um, vehicles being converted, converted without the approval of the, um, uh, um, the original owner of that vehicle. The NRCS made a proposal to the um, SABS te uh, Technical Committee um, to review and amend SANS 10319 um, which deals with the, the registration process of MIBs uh, so that we can enhance continuous uh, monitoring and compliance of the MIBs. Um, our intention is that once that standard has been approved, we will then reference it in the regulations uh, um, as part of the compulsory specification. The NRCS has initiated a project the Saver Vehicles 2025, 
which aim to align all motor vehicle regulations um, to the developments around the world. First, through our participation in the WP29, um, and to incorporate issues of self-driving cars, electrical vehicles, and, and, and so forth. And also to deal with some of the findings that have been identified by the public protector, as well as the uh, issues that happened previously with fires on motor vehicles. National uh, the Department of Transport and other stakeholders have been identified and they are part of that um, and, and a vehicle and, and safer vehicle 2025 project. And we have received uh, enormous support from all the stakeholders, including um, NAMSA. The recommendations by the NRC is to ensure that this issue does not recur in future and to deal with the remaining um, vehicles. The National Department of Transport needs to admin mark the remaining illegal panel vents, which we have identified as 2005 on the Natchez system and so that those vehicles cannot continue to operate on the road because they will not be able to obtain any registration um, if they are admin marked. We also recommend that the requirements for all vehicle modification should be reviewed so that we can deal with holistically with all the vehicle conventions, including the convention of taxis, ambulances, and trucks into buses. Standards, standardization of vehicle modification irrespective of use to eliminate the loophole where people convert vehicles under the, uh, the guise that the vehicle is not intended to be used as a taxi. A review of the legislation to articulate clearly the responsibility of each entity. A review of legislation to address the cross-cutting mandates. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mamadise. Um, Mr. Hannibal, does that include our presentations from all entities? You don't have any? Uh, yes, uh, Okay, so I'll take discussion now and then you can come afterwards to respond. Thanks very much, Jay. Okay. Um, Portfolio committee members, can I take hands for discussion on the presentation by DTIC, NRCS, and SABS? Can I see hands, please, members? Mr. Mubayani, Chair, and Ms. Muakse has raised their hands. Okay, we'll start with Mr. with Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me first welcome all the presentation mates. Uh, and also, I'm having a comment, Chair, with regard to the DC PTIC. Uh, Chair, it will be inappropriate to engage the lack of understanding of the public protector on the role of SABS and also the NRCS. As, the, as they did not take the report to review. Uh, and when they had a chance to do so. In other words, the chairperson, uh, whether the report and its recommendation are flawed, it's neither there nor there. Uh, my clarity-seeking question is that, uh, uh, as things stands, the findings and the remedial of action uh, in the, as the public protector are binding on the entities. Uh, what remedial actions uh, or implementation of the program 
are they engaging to moving forward? Because now we cannot uh, elaborate on the issue that just raised to say the public protector this and the public protector that, yeah, because that matter was not taken on review. So if not being taken on review, what is it that we do in moving forward as a DTIC? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbuyani. Honorable Burns, Mamashe. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Ch Chairperson. And my question uh, that I have, uh, firstly, uh, Chair, we, we must appreciate <clears throat> uh, the presentations uh, that have been made by the entities, uh, but also, uh, Chair, make a special uh, plea or request that uh, in future when they make uh, presentations, it is helpful not to use uh, abbreviations <clears throat> um, almost uh, all the time. Uh, yes, I can understand that uh, it is the sector they are used to. But for instance, we, from time to time, uh, this committee would have new members. Uh, and uh, those members must not find themselves uh, lost uh, in the process of the presentation. So um, I would just make that uh, um, um, a request. Coming now to uh, the questions, uh, Chair. Yes, we, we can see, Chair, that, uh, for instance, there seems to be uh, an MOU um, spoken about uh, between uh, the Bureau of Standards as well as uh, the regulatory body. But uh, uh, MOUs generally without uh, practical programs uh, embarked upon do not really yield a positive result. By their own uh, definition, it's about a uh, memorandum of understanding. So we understand that uh, uh, we, we, we are entering into this relationship. But the issue is about what are these entities uh, re practically and really doing about that in which they have agreed uh, to, to, to enter into a, 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 a cooperation relationship. So in view of that, Chair, I would be interested uh, to know as to the mutually reinforcing measures that have been implemented um, between uh, the Bureau of Standards uh, as well as the regulatory body. You know, uh, besides uh, the MOUs, you know, in, in, in practical terms, uh, because at the end of the day, Chair, um, this, 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 this is about ensuring quality standards that give a, a, a reasonable comfort uh, in terms of issues of safety uh, and, 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 and all of that. Given, given the challenges that we have, especially the carnages in our roads. So it's, it's going to be important to have a sense uh, of those uh, uh, practicalities. And the second question, Chair, we would also want to get a sense as to uh, the practical measures uh, that the department and the entities 
um, 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 adopted uh, to improve and update you know, the specifications for the automotive industry. And, 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 and also uh, measures uh, to curb uh, those that uh, are done uh, through uh, unconventional means. You know, uh, th 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 there's a term, Chair, which I don't really agree to, which I don't really like. Uh, when we talk about illicit practices within a particular industry, it will always be referred to as, uh, 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 you know, the black um, 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 the business, or, or, you know, is referred to as something that is black. And yet, um, the masterminds uh, behind those, uh, in most cases, are always referred to as white collar crime. You know, the master is there uh, sitting, manipulating all the processes in uh, cozy offices and uh, the the other people are doing the dirty job so 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 we need to know exactly uh, what is it that the department is doing also to ensure that uh, these uh, conditions to have this kind of practices you know uh, those conditions are actually put uh, to zero. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now to our brand new member to this committee, um, Honorable Chris Malimacha. Thank you, Chair. Let me take this opportunity to also join the choir and congratulate you on the new responsibility. Members, also join the choir to welcome the presentation. We must time and again bear in mind that whatever we are doing in a form of employment or given responsibility, Life. I'm saying this because the two entities, when they speak, they must never try to speak as if they operate differently from different countries. They must work jointly to ensure that we save lives. Here, when we talk of this industry that carries passengers on daily basis, in each and every year we are given the stats of many people died. However, uh, Chair, I was just raising that, that somewhere it touches that some other things has to take long to come and be corrected. I have three questions, Chairperson, with your allowance. That will be directly to start. Number one will be comrades. Has considered rendering confirmatory assessment service in order to improve the effectiveness of the two entities. Number two from the chairperson, from the vehicle sample test made by the SAT of illegally converted vans, was SAT not able to pick up the safety risk and possible non-compliance with safety standards, not with even the fact that SAT is not a regulator. We are very aware that SAT is not a regulator, but the above itself poses a lot of questions from it. Number three, noting that SAT does not set the, I mean, stability specifications. However, it will appear that there is a direct correlation between testing vehicles for national standards and vehicle safety standards. How does SAT ensure that after testing vehicles that this safety standards are implemented. Thank you very much, Chairperson. 
Thank you very much, um, Honorable Malimacha. Uh, Honorable Moatse. Thank you very much, uh, Prisan, for the opportunity. Uh, I've got a few questions on, on the NRCS. First question was, uh, what measures has been adopted by the NRCS to oversee the consistent compliance of the MIBs with the necessary specifications? And also, what measures has the NRCS taken into improve its surveillance strategy to combat non-compliance? If any, what sanctions or penalties were imposed in this regard? Lastly, Chairperson, what measures are in place to improve the, responsi the responsiveness of the NRC as to concerns of non-compliance? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Moatse. Are there any further questions before I hand over to the um, to the entities and the department uh, to respond to the issues raised by members? No hands, Chair. No hands. Okay. Can I then hand over to the team? Can I think uh, let's take SABS first. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, I think, um, Honorable Burns and Zawashe, thank you very much for the, the point. It is duly noted and apologies that we've included all these acronyms and I think you, you're absolutely right. We've become so used to working, uh, using these acronyms that um, one just assumes that it's, it's the normal discourse. So thank you very much for, for highlighting that. I think the, um, and I'm sure um, Edward will also talk to this, the, the MOU is, um, is a governing, it's, it's, a, it's a governance framework. Um, and um, there are lots of meetings, um, SABS tests, for instance, we test fish products um, at our lab in Cape Town. There's regular weekly meetings. There's uh, lots of interaction at the technical level, at a lab level between the NRCS um, and SABS relating to the test reports um, that, that we, or, or to the testing and the subsequent test report that we put out for the NRCS. So where there are issues um, uh, uh, and, and um, there, there may have been, um, you know, the colleagues aren't able to resolve them, Edward and I meet um, and, and, we, and we, we resolve them. So it's, it's a very practical um, arrangement um, the governance structure, the MOU is just to guide the, the process, but they are very practical lab specific interactions that happen on a daily and a weekly and a monthly basis. Um, so um, I think Edward will talk to the, the measures that they've put in place to improve the specifications. Once we get those, um, we've been able to reduce the number of days it takes to, to um, publish a national standard. It used to be over 400. Um, last, uh, it, we're just under 300 right now, and we have a very close monitoring arrangement on any um, technical committee that we feel is taking a bit too long to, um, to get the standard out, to get the work out. So, um, you know, th those are monitored weekly, um, um, and, and, and we report on those quarterly um, to, to the DTIC as well. Um, the um, conformity assessment services, SABS provides, um, thank you very much, Anbal um, Malimache, for your question. SABS does provide conformity assessment services to um, a number of, of players, um, including the NRCS, um, and that would then be governed by um, a, a service level agreement in terms of turnaround times that we would offer we would offer them. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. Um, please let me know if I if I haven't. Then I think the question that you've raised about um, picking up the safety risk, we have experts in terms of testing and test methodologies. The um, experts in terms of sector specific um, work reside in our technical committees and those are on a voluntary basis where they come in and help us develop the national standard. So we wouldn't know in the labs, whether that test 
would be sufficient or if there are other tests available necessarily we could consult with the technical committees to then identify that. Um, but the, the technical committees, they would put in the standard or amend the standard to say, you know what, this standard needs to be beefed up. And that's what Edward has indicated they've done. They've written to us to say, these standards need to be reviewed with these specific elements. Please look into this and, and, and start that process. So that that process is definitely um, on, ongoing. Then I think I, I think the point that you're making about implementation of standards and, and more broadly about how do we raise awareness for our standards, I think that is an area that we're working hard at. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, and so um, that, that definitely is work in progress. We do raise awareness through webinars, uh, publications, engagement. We've, we've got, had an extensive engagement with a number of industry associations, companies. Um, we, you know, industry associations, associations invite us to talk to their members. Um, and, and so we do have an awareness drive to, to talk about standards and how standards can and should be implemented and also the importance uh, of standards um, and how it supports trade and economic development. So um, there is some work um, on Rebel Malamache, but I think we do still have um, quite a bit of way to go in terms of creating that awareness. We've got some plans in place. We're trying to get that. Um, Minister Patel convened a meeting with all of the entities earlier this week. He's given us um, a strategic direction in terms of where we should be going. Um, and so we, we are we are working right now to respond to that. And one of the things he did raise was around, you know, awareness of standards. So that is certainly something that we'll be giving a lot more attention to um, in the coming financial year. Chair, I think those were the questions directed at me. Um, I'll pause and if there's anything else, I'll take further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Scholes. Um, Mr. Uh, Mamadise for in RCS. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honourable Members, for the questions. Um, I think let me just comment on the um, issue raised by Honourable Mbuyani that uh, it will be difficult to engage on the, um, the submissions against the public protector while we have failed to review the report. Indeed, it is so that public protector report is binding and the remedial action is binding until it's set aside by a court of law. So I think it should be taken in that context that as the NTT, as particularly as the NRCS, we are implementing all the recommendations uh, of the public pro protector report, and and despite the fact that we 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 have some concerns, the reason why we are putting those concerns before you is just that you need to have full information so that you separate facts from fiction. Um, in terms of the questions by Honourable Benz Mamashe. Uh, um, in our presentation, we included the, all, the list of all abbreviations in slide 35 to assist the honorable members to understand the acronyms that we are using. Um, however, we take your concern into consideration in the future presentations. <clears throat> On the issue of MOU with SAPS, um, indeed, um, it would be naive of us to say that um, because we have an MOU, um, all is good. We have a nice thing. It's not a nice thing to have. Um, but the, may, the key thing is that the MOU create a platform for um, engagements between ourselves and, 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 and SAPS on matters of mutual in, uh, interest and areas of collaboration. Um, we do have a STEERCOM um, um, that is set up in terms of that MOU, where it allows us to engage on various issues, including testing, standards development, conformity assessment, um, the, the labs, 
the labs. Um, the, as you know, we are also sharing facilities with SAPS. We are also able to engage on issues of facilities and, and, and the situation of our own labs within the facilities that we are occupying in SABS. So um, I think Ms. Scholz has uh, alluded to the fact that um, we are able to recommend some of the um, changes to the standards development that um, SAPS is administering through the work of the STEERCOM and, the, and, and our participation in some of the SABS committees dealing with standard development. So a lot of work is happening. Um, I might add that in addition to the MOU, we have identified a need to have SLAs that will talk to these specific issues that I, 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 I have alluded to in terms of the strengthening um, um, collaboration between ourselves and SAPS in the interest of the South African public. Um, in terms of the um, VC uh, improvement, as I've uh, alluded to, we have identified a project um, 2025, which is aimed at updating and reviewing all vehicle uh, regulations. We have completed the light passenger and good vehicles taking care requirements, but I must highlight that the a process for the review of regulations is a lengthy process because it involves, it's similar to how you develop a legislation more or less. It involves stakeholder consultations, application of the VC for public comments. Once we have public comments, we also need to respond to those public comments and then submit a final VC for consideration by the DTIC. So they, on average, that process may take up to um, um, up to a year, um, and depending on the uh, various factors uh, in the process. Um, what measures have we taken to address the issues that have been highlighted by the PP? Um, I must uh, highlight the fact that uh, um, we can only take measures that fall within our mandate and our legal scope because the NRCS is a creature of statute and we can only do so much in terms of the empowering legislation. Um, I think I've highlighted most of the measures that we have already taken to implement the public protector uh, report, um, including the fact that um, we have um, uh, conducted, uh, uh, um, established a task team to look in at all the issues and the gaps that have been raised by the public protector in our processes to ensure that we continuously improve in terms of how we regulate the MIBs. Um, and some of the recommendations will be coming out of the report once it is finalized so that we can um, um, recommend either to the DTIC or through our internal process how we can improve upon the, 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 the measures that are in place. Um, I think those are the relevant oh, questions from Honorable Mwate. I almost forgot about those. What measures um, to we do to, to, to oversee consistent compliance? Um, um, there are two ways as um, uh, we have alluded to ensure compliance with the, um, the compulsory specification. The first is the approval process where all the and, and manufacturers and builders of vehicles will apply for approval by submitting a sample to us, as well as um, and, uh, supporting documents to ensure that the vehicle that is seeking approval for is 
in line with the legislation and complies with the compulsory specification. If we are satisfied that it does, we will then issue um, um, a letter of approval or a compliance certificate together with notice number. The second tier of ensuring consistent and uh, continuous um, compliance is through our market surveillance strategy, which is supported by our, by our risk-based approach in terms of which we are able to identify high-risk MIBs and uh, ensure that they are visited by our inspectors on continuous basis to ensure compliance with compulsory specification. And one of the of the recommendations that is coming out of the the the, the work that we are doing um, um, in implementing the public protectors as a report is the issue of introducing conformity of production um, for vehicles. Um, that means that um, Although, although the, 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 the MIB will be submitting a sample um, of, for us, they need to ensure that all other vehicles that they are going to produce similar to the sample that they have submitted to us continue to meet the requirements of the specification throughout the process of the production. If there is anything wrong happening, we are able to intervene through uh, um, the scope of the uh, con continuous conformity of production requirements. Um, how do we improve on market surveillance inspection and implement sanctions? Um, as I've uh, indicated, Chair, we we have in, um, in the recent years introduced the risk-based approach, which helps us to improve on, on, on our inspection in terms of dedicating the resources where they are required the most and focusing on the high-risk uh, uh, um, manufacturers and builders of motor vehicles in this case. Um, Whenever we find non-compliances, um, we have um, been empowered in terms of section 15 of our own act to issue directives for any kind of non-compliance. The actions may include retaining whatever product to the country of origin. It may include classificating the product. It may include destruction of the product depending on the circumstance of each case, or we may deal with it as we deem fit in terms of our own processes. But in specific, in relation specifically to the MIBs, the only power that we have is in terms of section seven is to recommend the dear registration of that MIB if they are found to be non-compliant with the legislation as we have done with the, the Umgeni um, auto trimmers that I've alluded during my presentations. The concerns of um, non-compliances, um, we have um, processes that help us to manage any concerns, including the concerns that have been highlighted by the public protector. One way of doing that is to um, register the complaint and then allocate a complaint to a specific unit. If it is relating to automotive, um, the head of the automotive will be in charge of, of that particular complaint and ensure that the complaint is investigated and feedback is provided. Um, um, but in relation to the PP's concerns, as it in this case, um, we have taken a step further to establish a task team to look at compressively at uh, vehicle conversions in general and to look at the risk factors pertaining to uh, the, the, the work that is being done by the MIBs. And I think it is important that we await the outcomes of that uh, report so that we can be able to improve further 
um, in terms of our internal processes. I don't know, Chair, if one of my colleagues would want to add on what I have just said. Duncan, do you want to add? Yeah, just before so, before yes. we, we bring Duncan on board, I see Honorable Mutawung's hand is up. Um, Honorable, Honorable Mutawung, if your questions have not been covered by the responses so far, I'll give you this opportunity to to raise your 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 discussion points. Honorable Mutawung. Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, only questions. Uh, one. Three. The 1,300 annual NRBs inspections, how many have been found to be non compliant? And secondly, how many does the team of inspectors conduct uh, surveillance on MIBs, particularly those involved in converting carrying? vehicle into passengers carrying uh, vehicles. Lastly, what practical efforts are in with the various uh, relevant stakeholders to identify or to detect vehicles that are non-compliant and to avert a continuation of the same problem? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Motaung. Mr. Mutingwe, is there anything you want to add? Um, yeah, thank you, Chair, and good morning to um, everyone. Uh, perhaps what I could just add is to respond to the question from um, Honorable Mwate with regards to the improvements, with regards to the responsiveness of the NRCS, particularly the automotive uh, department. Um, so I think the, the report of the public protector has actually uh, made us to be agile enough in terms of dealing with issues that are happening out uh, in the market. So accordingly, we, we established a, a task team, a task team in the sense that we formulated a unit uh, within the automotive department that handles uh, queries that are coming to, to the department, uh, concerns which would be uh, perhaps a, an ordinary citizen complaining about uh, the vehicles that they might have bought and finding them to be perhaps uh, not uh, not being safe, we will take that and we investigate that. And also any other complaint that might be aligned uh, directly to, to the automotive business unit. So we have done that because of, um, we, we have realized that uh, when such things are raised and they are not attended to, um, we end up sometimes going to find ourselves in the media for us uh, not, not actually doing our work. So we have actually have a, we have a, a responsive team that deals with uh, su 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 such matters. Um, perhaps also maybe to take um, the question from Honorable Mutawang with regards to uh, the number of um, non-compliances that were identified for, uh, for the uh, 1,300 companies that we have inspected. I think it's, it's proper just to clarify the fact that that was just a, an average of how many um, MIBs are we able to inspect on an annual basis when we look at our stats uh, from the previous uh, financial years. So it is very much dependent on the resources that we have that we are able to can only deal with uh, 1,300. At this point in time, we cannot really quantify the number of non-compliances and over a particular period, uh, but we can highlight the fact that the non-compliances that we normally identify would be um, issues of non-adherence to the originally approved uh, vehicle. Uh, in, in the main, it would be uh, particularly in the trailer manufacturing industries. Um, it would be also in the um, other components uh, that support uh, the uh, uh, vehicle manufacturing processes, but what what we will do is, uh, as the CEO has already alluded, uh, invoke uh, Section 15 of the NRCS Act, or we would, um, if it is a motor vehicle, invoke um, uh, 
regulation 44 of the national road traffic act where we can then delink uh, that particular model that is affected by the non-compliances uh, so that um, such a manufacturer importer or a builder uh, will not be able to register further vehicles in that regard i must really say that the, there's been quite a lot of work that is being done also in the trailer manufacturing industry because that is where the majority of the non-compliances have, have been have been found. I thank you, Chair, and I think perhaps maybe the CEO can deal with the other questions. CEO, do you want to come back? Is Mama Jose? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think the only question that we left is the practical steps with the that we are taking with the stakeholders. Um, I think some of the practical steps that we are we are taking is to is in terms of the MOU that we have with the Department of Transport which forms the platform to engage on all the issues that we identify through our inspection work of the MIBs. Um, we are also able to highlight some of our findings um, and process improvement that we would recommend in terms of the legislation um, 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 pertaining to vehicle regulation in general. I think that's the only thing that I would want to add. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Can I just check with um, uh, Mr. Hanava if there's any concluding remarks? Um, thanks very much, um, Honourable Chair. Maybe just very briefly to um, to agree with Honourable Mbuyani around the Public Protector's Report. Um, we we do accept that, and I think the um, that is reflected in uh, the extent to which the entities and the DTIC today have tried to focus on um, the implementation of the remedial action uh, uh, actions that the Public Protector. Um, indicated we need to uh, we need to implement. Um, just a, a, a second point um, that uh, perhaps uh, um, responds to Honourable uh, Burns uh, Namashe's um, question around essentially the illicit economy and what conditions are in place um, to prevent this kind of thing happening again. Um, so, Chair, I think um, it's it's fair to say that we have tightened up the. Uh, the um, the tools that we have available quite significantly. Um, it's uh, never the case that we can say that this will never ever happen again, um, but it will certainly be much more difficult in the in the sense of we've got much stronger surveillance, we've got um, uh, tightening of the standards, and and the two institutions have talked about that. Um, but chair, I think it is um, probably um, worth uh, flagging that. Um, I don't think any of us can really rest easy at night until the 1,700 odd um, uh, illegally converted uh, panel vans are off our roads. And, and so it may well be that perhaps the, um, the committee uh, would want to note that enforcement um, remains a, a bit of a challenge and that um, the department will, of course, continue to work with uh, the agencies and the other national departments like uh, DOT um, to, to try and strengthen enforcement um, and to make sure that those, um, those illegally converted panel vans are, are taken off the roads. Um, so I think that, that might be an additional area. And then, of course, it would be ideal if there was consequence management for some of the licensing officials that in the public protector's report seems to have um, allowed licensing of the vehicles as taxis when in fact they, they should not have. Um, but I think that's all from, from our side, Chair. We, we certainly have taken this um, uh, the report seriously and the remedial actions um, that have been put in place, we, we think will uh, go a long way to ensuring that we don't have uh, a repeat of um, what we saw in, in 2009. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Honeywell, and to your team and the teams from the entities who have reported to us today. I think in, uh, in concluding our discussion uh, today, the purpose, as we said at the beginning, was to, uh, to check the implementation of the action plans um, that uh, the remedial actions that were set by the public protector in a report. So um, what I want to, in conclusion, ask is that 
because we've received a presentation from the from the department, we've received a presentation from NRCS and SABS that we uh, get a document that sets out the action plans that have been submitted to the public protector so that we then uh, in doing our oversight uh, um, uh, and drawing up our report uh, have a clear picture of how those action plans have been implemented because we've received various presentations from you if that can be arranged. I don't know if that would come from the department, um, Mr. Honeywell, whether you'd be able to do that. Um, yes, Chairperson, I think, I think it would be appropriate that DTIC um, incorporates the, uh, the inputs from SABs and NRCS and then provides a, um, a comprehensive report to the, um, to the committee. Um, we can certainly do that, Chair. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So that concludes our deliberations for today. And thank you all for your attendance. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope the budget, um, the, the budget speech today doesn't burst any bubbles. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Chair? Chair? Sorry? Before we yeah. conclude, Chair, uh, and, and in terms of your request that you made to the DTIC in, in regarding the the admission of that report. Can we determine a time frame because we are required to do as a committee a report on the matter. So it will be good if we indicate to the DTIC when they should submit that report so that we can start proceedings in terms of our committee uh, obligations with respect to the report. Uh, maybe you can give us an indication, Secretary, what would be a reasonable time frame to set? I think, Chair, but I think within a week, if we can get, receive the, 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 the reports from the DTIC, then that will assist us in starting our processes, Chair. That will be, if the DTIC is, in, if, is found to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so within seven days, um, Mr. Hannibal, if we can receive that report so that we can conclude our uh, reporting on this matter. Thank you very much. Uh, um, in closing the meeting, um, committee secretary, if you can just um, announce our next meeting or any other further announcements you wish to make. Chair, um, our next meeting is next week, Tuesday, the 1st of March. We will receive a briefing by the DTRC on, on the 2020-21 on annual incentive report, Chair. That is scheduled for the 1st of March and the 2nd of March, we will receive a briefing by the SIU on the status of its investigation into allegations of corruption at the National Lotteries Commission Chair. Those are the two meetings scheduled for next week. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to all members and all, everybody else on the platform. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, thank Chair. You, thank you, Chairperson. Recording Bye. stopped. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat>